Okay, you ready? Mark chapter 2. We're going to be looking at this morning the blessing of forgiveness, and we find that in Mark's gospel. And so I'll begin reading here in Mark chapter 2 at verse 1. I'll read to verse 12, and I'll be sharing concerning the blessing of forgiveness out of Mark chapter 2. Mark writes again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when, it, when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, Take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. And so, as we begin, let me give you a backdrop. You need to have kind of a context in which to understand what Mark is talking about here when he says in verse 1 that he had entered Capernaum after some days. When you look in chapter 1, you're going to see that Jesus is already doing a lot of ministry. He's been healing. He's been teaching. He's casting out demons, preaching throughout the region called Galilee. When you look at a map of Israel, it's usually divided into three basic sections. In, the, in your Bible, you'll see the southern portion. It's called Judah or Judea. The center portion normally would be referred to as, as Samaria and all. And then when you get up to the north, it's the Galilee. And so Jesus is in the north, in Galilee, when all of this is taking place, and, and he's, been, he's been ministering, teaching, preaching, casting out demons. He's been ministering throughout that region, and what is happening at this time is his fame is spreading, and people begin now to seek after him. They're hearing about this man called Jesus, and they're beginning to follow after him. If you looked at chapter 1, you'd notice in verses 32 and 33 how that Mark points this out. When he says, at evening when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. So you'd see he's making an impact, in other words. In Mark 1, again, in verse 37, uh, it speaks concerning his apostles looking for him. And it says in Mark 1, 37, when they found him, they said to him, everyone's looking for you. And then when you get uh, a little further on into verse 45, Jesus had cleansed the leper and all and had told him not to say anything. Well, in Mark 1.45, it says that he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city but was outside in deserted places. And they came to him from every direction. So when Mark says he was outside in other places, he went to other places, and uh, that's why it would seem that it was difficult and he withdrew and he went and did other ministries. So Matthew speaks about the fact that he had gone to a place called the Gadarenes and he had cast out a demon out of demons out of a couple of men and all. And now he's returning from the Gadarenes and once again re-entering into the city. So he is now returning. Notice in verse one again, he entered Capernaum after some days and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. And so the people have discovered that he's there. And uh, as they've discovered, it was heard that he's there, and so they came to see him. He's more than likely in the home of, of the apostle Peter, but he can't move around freely anymore. People are looking for him. It says in verse 2, immediately many gathered together, there was no longer room to receive them. 
So word had spread that Christ is back in town. A crowd has gathered to hear him. This modest home is now filled. There was a courtyard or porch area in the front. That's even filled. And so when he sees all of these people and they're pressing in to try and hear him and all of that, notice what he does. In verse 2, when he sees all these people, notice he preached the word to them. He preached the word to them. Let me give you some application about that for just a moment. As I mentioned earlier, on Wednesday nights, we're doing a series on the history and ministry of Calvary Chapel. And as a young man, I was 20 years old the first time I ever entered into a Calvary Chapel. It was the only Calvary Chapel. It was uh, with Pastor Chuck Smith. And he had a young man who worked alongside of him. His name was Lonnie Frisbee. And so as a young man, I went to that church after being saved. I can still remember the first time I walked in because I wasn't a believer. There were people who were bringing friends to hear the gospel. That's the heart, by the way, of the Jesus movement. The heart of the Jesus movement is the word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, and inviting people to know Christ. That's the heart of our movement. That's the way it was. That's the way it's always been. And so my friends who had recently begun going to this church called Calvary Chapel invited me. I can still remember the first time walking in in a, in a, a small chapel that, that was built to hold maybe a couple hundred people, that there were people on the floor, there were people on the side, there were people in the aisles. There was no seating for them. There were that many, and they were all young. They were all young people. And so I remember all the way back then, back in 1970, in the summer of 1970, walking in and being basically ambushed by this atmosphere. And it, it wasn't because there was some, some oddness going on. It wasn't entertaining. There wasn't smoke being billowing out during worship and, and somebody coming down from, uh, you know, out, you know from, the, from the ceiling, you know, being dropped down with a white robe or anything weird. I've known people who do that. I remember one of my guys I know who rode his motorcycle up the center aisle, you know, to get attention and just as odd. It was none of that. I told Rawl, you shouldn't do that, bro. It's, a, it's not a good thing. But anyway, it, it wasn't anything like that. It, what it was was the presence of the Lord. It was God. We had come to hear about Jesus. We hadn't come to hear the stories of the preacher. We didn't come to be entertained by his humor. We didn't come because he would march around that platform and, and draw us in with his entertaining style at all. Pastor Chuck was just, you know, to me, he was an old man. He was 43. <laughs> you know, so it wasn't his, his personality. and There was something else there. It was the presence of God. You see, we learned from a very early age that what people need is God. They need His Word. They need His Spirit. And so church was not and is not an entertainment for us. Church, for us, was meeting God in a special way. And that's what's taking place here. <coughs> Excuse me, it's the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. I'm looking for water. There it is, I have to drink. Salute. <laughs> God moves through his word. I was a young man. I was at Biola. And uh, I had a professor that was very dear to me. His name was Dr. Moore. I was about, well, our church had just started. I was 31. And uh, Dr. Moore and I were having lunch. And Dr. Moore said to me, Dave, I want to ask you a question. Why is your church growing? Now, you need to know that back in 1981, it was still unusual, 82, it was still unusual to have a rapidly growing church. It is to this day. What we in California have gotten used to is is large church environments, but you need to know that the average church in the nation on a Sunday morning has less than 80 people. The average church has less than 80 people attending. 
You may not know that. We're a bit of an anomaly here, but the average church has less than 80. The, the number has been uh, uh, noted at around 65. So when your church is growing and you have more than 100 or 200 people, especially when it's just been planted, that was unusual. And so my friend, Dr. Moore, was a professor of church growth at Biola. So Dr. Moore wanted to ask me questions. So he said, Dave, let me ask you, why is your church growing? Now, he's a professor of church growth, a friend of mine. And uh, I had read seven books on church growth. I knew what he was fishing for. I knew the 10 signs of a healthy church and things like that. I knew those things by heart. And so he said, can you tell me? And I was about to speak to him the way I thought he wanted me to, to validate his points, the things that he teaches. He said, but just a minute, I have to get up. I'm going to get something. I'll be right back. And as the Lord is my witness, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart when he got up and walked away. And he said, if you say anything to take glory from me, I will take my hand off your ministry. I sensed that, that and I just sat there thinking, oh, okay. And Dr. Moore came and sat down and put his tray in front of him. And he said, now, where were we? Oh, yeah. Why is your church growing? And I said, I don't know. I got no idea. It's all the work of God. You know, it's just him, Dr. Moore. I really don't know because the Holy Spirit is the one who draws people. Listen, wherever Jesus is, people want to be. If Jesus is the center, people are drawn to him because we may be able, churches are able to get very good uh, speakers who can hire them who will come. They can have great bands. People will come for a price. But that doesn't cause the people to be in love with Christ. You see, when Jesus came and he would speak, people would hear the, the man who is preaching, the man who is teaching with such authority, the man who has power to cast out demons, to, to heal those who are sick, is here amongst us. They would come and they would show up so many that they began to crowd in and try to get to him, which is again what, ha what I experienced as a young believer going to Calvary there with Pastor Chuck and, and Lonnie and all to see the young people who would, they would line up, we would line up. If you didn't get there a half hour early, you were late. You were late. And there were so many people showing up that they actually took the wall and removed the wall and put glass windows and they put uh, speakers so that the latecomers would actually be seated outside hearing the Bible study because you couldn't get inside. Because wherever Jesus Christ is, people are drawn to him. And that's the secret of church growth, if you will, is preaching the gospel and presenting Jesus Christ and we would come. We would come for this, this Bible study. We would come to, to hear about Jesus Christ because the center is Jesus. And he had said in, in chapter 1, verse 38, and I'll read it to you. Jesus had said, uh, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also because for this purpose I have come forth. Let's continue to go out and take the word. You see, the center of the ministry is a preaching. Now, why is proclaiming the message of the gospel so important? Well, it's because the only, it's the only message that provides salvation. It's the only message. You're not going to get saved by holding on to the, um, the, 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 the various religious philosophies of this age. You get saved through the gospel. And so Jesus Christ, and he was preaching the gospel. Why? Because people need to hear it. According to John 5.24, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And that's why Christ came. He said, I have been sent to proclaim this message. And the crowds needed to become his converts or else they would have been forever lost. He didn't want people to simply come and hear him speak. He didn't want them to come simply to wonder at his works. They needed to be saved. Now why? Why do they need to be saved? Well, first thing is because people are totally lost without him. 
The Bible teaches that the human race is completely lost in sin. In Romans 3, 10 through 12, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. That's true. That's human nature. That's what we see today is that people really aren't good. We are all lost in sin. We're all in need of salvation. We can tell ourselves we're okay because when we, we may not be as bad as the person next to us, but we're not as good as God. We're not as good as Jesus Christ. We're all lost. There's none righteous. No one understands. No one seeks for God. Everyone's turned aside. They have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. We are lost without Christ. Second, because of our sin nature, we stand condemned. We're already condemned as we, if, if we're not saved, we're already in the state of condemnation. John 3, 18, whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And then third, after death comes judgment and eternal punishment awaits unbelievers. It's appointed unto men to die once. After this, the judgment. Jesus in Luke 12, 4 and 5 said it like this. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that they have, no, have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he is killed has power to cast you into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. That's from Jesus. Be, people are lost in sin. We rebelled against God. But God sent his son to rescue us. Jesus in Luke 19, 10 says, the son of man has come to seek and save that which was lost. So when Jesus sees these lost people, he doesn't want them to come for entertainment. He doesn't want them to wonder at the gracious words that proceed out of his mouth alone. He wants them to, to receive that message, to be transformed, to be forgiven, to know God and to have a new life because he knows that they are sheep without a shepherd because he knows that they're lost and he had come to save that which was lost. He sees that crowd. And notice what it says to us in verse, verse 2. He preached the word to them. Preaching and teaching. The word teach is speaking about an appealing to the mind with information. When someone is teaching the word of God, they're giving information, appealing to the mind to assimilate that and be transformed by it. That's teaching. But preaching is an appeal to the will. It's a, it's a word that goes out that is speaking to you in such a way that you know that there's, there's a decision you have to make. And so when Jesus would come in and he would preach, he was speaking in a way to cause people to realize they have to decide to do what he's saying or reject it. And so what Jesus is doing here in Mark 2 is he's preaching the word of God to them. He's speaking to them in a way so that they may know what truth is and embrace it. So he gave the gospel. The gospel has been called a word of repentance. It's a word of grace. It's a word of truth. It's a word of life. It's a word of eternal salvation. And as he's speaking, he's speaking to a mixed audience. You see, every time the word of God is spoken, there is what would be called a mixed crowd, a mixed audience. In this particular case, there were friends and disciples who came to hear his word. These were people who wanted to hear him speak. They were hungry for truth. And that's still true today. There are people who come to church, who come to church because we want a Bible study. We want to know who Christ is. How can I live to please him? I want to worship him. But there are also there what we used to call groupies, people who come to be just part of a crowd. And again, that's seen today in people who go to Christian events, but they'll leave when the teaching begins. They'll come and they'll say, well, you need to hear this concert. And so people come, they like the singing, but when the word is being taught, they walk out. Years ago, we had a well-known well music uh, uh, personality with us, and I, I've shared this recently, but we had a well-known uh, musical personality, and, and when uh, her set was finished, I came out to the pulpit, and I said, well, she won't be singing again. For those of you who came, to hear her sing but not the word, we're gonna take a moment to greet one another. That'll be your opportunity to leave. 
Because if you're not here for the Word of God, and you just get up during the study, it disrupts everything. So why don't we visit for a second, say hi to the person next to you, and that gives you an opportunity to go without disturbing anybody else, if you came for singing and not God's Word. And people got up and left. My whole staff did. I fired them all. You know, people, people got up and left because that's human hearts. That's what they do. They come for the event, but not for the preaching of the word and teaching. In the book of Ezekiel, in, in chapter 33, verses 30 through 32, this is what we read. As for you, son of man, the children of your people are talking about you beside the wall and in the doors of the houses. And they speak to one another, everyone saying to his brother, please come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. So they come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people, and they hear your words. But they do not do them, for with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. So you had the groupies there, you had the disciples there, and you had the critics there, the religious sinners, the Pharisees. They were filled with envy, looking, and looking for ways to discredit him. You see, religious sinners are always difficult to reach because they think they're already saved. And those are the people who were there. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. So the stage is set. Verse 3, Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. So the man is a paralytic, totally incapable of moving about on his own. So four men carried him to Jesus. As his friends, they brought him to the one who could relieve him of his suffering. As those who loved him, they brought him to the Lord. In Proverbs 17, verse 17, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Remember this always, guys. True friends are the ones who bring you to the Lord, not take you away from him. So I'm going to give you pastoral advice at this moment. Choose your friends wisely because you influence one another for good or for bad. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. So develop friendships with those who lift your faith, not those who encourage less of you. Because there are people who will encourage less of you. I remember a young woman who at one time had had attended our fellowship. She'd been here as a little girl into her, her uh, late teens. And she had a boyfriend, and she was beginning to wonder what her relationship was going to be with him, and she had begun to consider the possibility of giving herself physically to him. And she went to another young woman. Obviously, this came to my attention after the fact. But she went to another young woman, and she said, I'm considering sleeping with him. What do you think? And her friend said, you know, I've slept with some guys, and I don't feel any different about myself. And so she slept with her boyfriend. She lost her purity. She made some bad decisions and ended up reaping the consequences. Be careful who you influence. Be careful who you allow to influence you. Be careful who you allow to speak into your life. You know, your, your, your pastor isn't necessarily me, the guy who stands up there on Sunday. Your pastor very often is your best friend. Is your best friend that you go with afterwards and you go to the game today to watch it or, or, or go out to eat after a church service. It's, it's your friend who very often is there talking to you after the service, if you talk about it at all, who may say, well, you know what he said? I, I don't believe that because I've seen it different. I've been in other places and they've taught this and they taught that. And, so, and they pour into you things that keep you from doing the right thing very often because they refuse to do the right thing themselves. Do not be deceived. Because bad relationships will corrupt your life. Be aware of that. We influence one another all the time. And in church, very often, you've got people who tell you to do the wrong thing because they themselves choose not to do the right. Be careful with that. So develop friendships with those who lift your faith. 
not those who encourage less of you. These guys were encouragers. They actually believed that Christ could do something, and they brought their friend to Christ. It says in verse 4, when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Now at that time, the roofs very often had flat, they were flat, and, and the people would, would rest on top of that roof on warm summer nights to, to receive the cool breeze. It was flat. It had beams that ran transversely. They were normally overlaid with brushwood, tree branches. They were covered with a thick blanket of mud or adobe. And so what happened is these people had this, this man on this, this uh, pallet, and they walked up the side stairs, and they placed him down, and they knelt down, and they figured out where Jesus would be, and they began to dig on that roof, and they began to open it up, and they began to work. And you could hear the noise above you, and Jesus would have been speaking. And as he's speaking, there's a, a thin crack in the ceiling, and now it begins to widen, and it looks like worms are starting to invade the ceiling as you see their fingers as they're breaking up and moving that roof. And now you see dust and, and debris that begins to settle. And the dust begins to fill the room. And Christ is just teaching and he stops and he looks and everybody is silent wondering what's going on. Now there's a, a hole in the roof. And slowly and gently, they begin to lower the bed on which the friend is lying. And they have ropes that are attached, it would seem. And they begin to lower him. Down, lower him. And Jesus is there. You can almost see the man being lowered. He can't do anything to resist this. He's just on the mat. And I almost can see him as his eyes meet Jesus as he's coming down. And Jesus looks up and says, hey, what's up? <laughs> and the guy goes, I don't know. And he drops, and now he's before him. Can you imagine that for a minute? Think, think about that. How interesting that would have been to be in that room to watch this take place. And the people begin to wonder what's going to happen as Jesus begins to look at him. But I want you to notice what happened. Verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic. It's revealing how Mark says that Jesus didn't see their work. He saw their faith. Now, there are times when genuine faith is something that is observable by our works. In James 2, 17 and 18, even so faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Oh, show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. These men had faith and their faith was in action. There were works that were coming alongside their faith. Their faith was, provo was provoking their works. Somebody said there are many who say they have faith in God, but their faith never is accompanied by any works. Yet in Scripture, we see the faith of Noah, who was moved with fear and built an ark. We see the faith of Abraham, who when commanded to sacrifice Isaac, prepared to offer him up, knowing God was able to raise him from the dead. We see the faith of Moses, who forsook the riches of Egypt because he looked for a greater reward. And we see the faith of Elijah, who withstood 450 false prophets of Baal. We see the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who refused to bow before Nebuchadnezzar's graven image, and of Daniel, who was cast into a lion's den. Faith is demonstrated by works, and true faith is seen by lives of faith. Workless faith has been called worthless faith. Head faith and said faith is not genuine faith. These men had true faith in Jesus. 
And Jesus saw their faith. He saw what they were willing to do to bring this man to Christ. Again, I got saved because I had friends who were willing to bring me to Christ, even when I was difficult and didn't want to go. But they had an insistence about them. And it's very possible that this man could very well have not necessarily wanted to be in, that, in the presence in that way, drawing attention to himself. But these men knew that the one who could take care of the needs of their friend was Jesus Christ. And nothing stopped them from bringing this man to the one who could heal him. It's interesting, though, in verse 5, how it says, Jesus saw their faith but spoke to the paralyzed man. And he said, son, your sins are forgiven you. You see, this is what he desired, and this is what he needed. He, he, he didn't need to continue walking or to, to walk so much as to know the forgiveness of God. He was crippled, and his body was already in a prison. But he needed a freedom that walking wouldn't give him. There are a lot of people today who walk but are still in a prison. They may be walking, but they're the walking dead. They're people who are not spiritually alive. They're, they're in a prison, and, and, and they're in need of, of something that's deeper than just the ability to perform physical things. And that's how it was with this man here. Jesus in Matthew 16, 26 asked, What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? And so he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are, done, your sins are done away with. They're driven away from you. You see, sins need to be forgiven, not excused. And sins should not become the norm of a society. You see, when we excuse sinful behavior, we end up sending people to therapy and not Jesus. My, my dad, when I was all messed up and I had been arrested again, he, he took me to a therapist he took me because he thought there was something wrong with my mind, but there was something wrong with my soul. And, and this is what had to be dealt with. You need to go to Christ. I needed forgiveness. He needed forgiveness more than the ability to walk. And that's why Jesus speaks of this, because Jesus wanted to bring him a, 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 a joy in the soul that he didn't have. In Psalm 32, 1 through 5, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. Day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So Jesus knew that the man had cried out for forgiveness and he's granting it to him. There's no doubt that this man on that mat had said, I wish, God, would you help me? God, I need your help. Before I got saved, that, that was what was happening in me. I can remember it. God, there is, I, this is my prayer. I still remember it. God, there is something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. God, help me. There is something I can't. I don't know how to love. I'm hurting my family. I don't have any friends. I don't have anything. I can still remember praying like that. I hadn't prayed for so long, but now I was praying. And I still remember saying that to him, God help me. And I still remember these words, there is something wrong with me. There is something wrong with me. When I got drafted and I was going into the military and my mom, my dad, my two sisters, we're in the kitchen. And I originally was supposed to go in August 25th. My birthday is August 23rd. And August 24th, we celebrated my birthday along with the birthdays of two of my friends. And from early in the evening until three in the morning, we were drinking and smoking pot. And I was real loaded. And I went home and I went into the house Actually, I sat in my car watching my mom come to the window looking for her son. And I waited until she turned the light off in the kitchen and went to bed. And I still remember I was smoking dope. And I still remember turning to a couple friends of mine who were there in the car with me. And I said, there's my mom. Look at her, man. She's looking for me. 
and she doesn't even know I'm sitting here in the car and we're smoking and I waited for that light to go off and I went in the side door and I went into the room and I lay down on my bed it was 3 in the morning I woke up at 5.30 I didn't really sleep I still remember waking up in a pool of sweat and I walked into the kitchen it was 6 o'clock my dad my mom and my two sisters my dad was folding his arm just staring at me his arms staring at me my mom was crying and my two sisters were crying I remember that my dad just shook his head at me and my mom said to me you couldn't come home one night and I said to her I'm leaving now for a couple of years you won't see me again so you ought to be happy I'm out of your life that's where I was then I went into the into LA my dad drove me there gave me ten dollars drove me to the recruitment uh, recruitment uh, building and I went in I had a friend named Gary who was also there he had a lid he had some some pot I had ten dollars we were both rejected that day I had a criminal record that they were aware of and he also did and so we were both rejected we went out we smoked some pot I used my dad's ten dollars and you gotta understand this back in 1970 it was worth a whole lot more than ten dollars and I bought us breakfast called a friend picked me up and Gary took us home I came walking in loaded because Gary had brought a lid with him my dad looks at me because he was on vacation and he says what are you doing here and I said even the army doesn't want me and I laughed and I slept it off I went into the room I hadn't slept I was loaded I was still loaded from the night before and that was my life and I finally began to say to God I can walk but I'm not alive I needed something more I needed something more than just physical life I needed forgiveness and that's when I started praying like many of you God there's something wrong with me I don't know what it is but there's something wrong with me I don't know how to love I don't know how to care I don't have any of that in me I don't have any of that in me this man's on a mat and he can't walk and his friends only know what's on the outside most of us don't tell our friends what we're really going through most of us don't call our friend up and say you need to know this we may throw it on Facebook people like to do that but we don't tell real people this is where I'm at these are the secret things I'm dealing with this man was paralyzed not just physically there was something in his soul there was something inside him something deep that was eating at him and Jesus looks at him sons your son your sins are forgiven you because that's what he needed to hear you see what does a prophet a man to gain the whole world and and lose his soul what will a man give in exchange for his soul there there's, there are worse things than than not being able to walk being crippled in sin is one of them and that's where Jesus began and as he says it to him he says your sons are your sins are forgiven you notice verse 6 some of the scribes were sitting there reasoning in their hearts why does this man speak blasphemies like this who can forgive sins but God alone what gives this man the right to do something like that they had gathered together they were going to formulate a charge against Jesus and now they have opportunity when Jesus pronounced forgiveness of sins for the man they reacted internally and they're saying within themselves this man blasphemes he's insulting the honor of God who can forgive sins but God only they're incensed mere men do not forgive sins only God can well Daniel 9 says it like this in verse 9 to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness though we have rebelled against him Isaiah 43 25 I even I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more 
Jesus is claiming authority to forgive sin. And the reasoning he is, he is claiming to be God. Well, immediately, verse 8, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Their reasoning amongst themselves wasn't lost on him. He knew what they were thinking. Psalm 44, 21, he knows the secrets of the heart. Hebrews 4, 13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. He was reading them. He knew it was within them. And thus he addresses that in that way. We sometimes think that we can hide things from God as if the Lord doesn't see. The other day, my grandson walks up to me and he says, Papa, he says, can I, can I have some gum? He loves gum. And I said, well, it depends. Did your daddy say you could have some? And he goes, oh, yes. I said, oh, really? Your dad's here. I said, um, let's go ask him. Well, you know, he goes like that to me. Well, you know, um, no, we don't need to. I mean, you can see through it, and I'm just a grandfather. And you think we're hiding from God? Just because I'm good at wearing a mask before man, just because I can put on my Sunday best and appear to be righteous and loving and caring, God knows my heart. He knows what's really in there. And Jesus reads, and he knows, and he perceives what's going on inside of them. He knows. And that's why he speaks to them. You see, it's easy to say, um, your sins are forgiven. It's easy to say, arise. It, it, it's easy to say that. Uh, saying someone's sins are forgiven may not instantly be seen, though. Saying someone is healed is more easily verified because the healing will be visible. And so he's asking the question, uh, what's easier? Your sins are forgiven or rise, take up the bed. But, verse 10, that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, go to your house. How do you think he said that? Do you think he suddenly just started shaking and quivering? And his, his, no. You know, one of the things I see on TV sometimes that freaks me out is ministers who think they have to get dramatic at moments like that. I, 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 the way I, I, I really would believe it's more normal in the case of Christ that he looked up and he said, I say unto you, rise, take up your bed and walk. I think it was a matter of fact kind of thing. Rise, take up your bed and walk. And something inside of that man responded. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. The invisible forgiveness is demonstrated by a visible healing. The man responded. The cripple was made to walk through faith and obedience. Now here's some practical application for you. I want you to remember, and notice with me, Jesus gave an impossible command. It was impossible for this man to do what Jesus said. Impossible. He could not do that. He had to be carried in. He could not do that. It was impossible. Yet, we see a response. Now, there are times that Jesus would give impossible commands. Notice uh, in chapter 3, notice verse 1 of Mark. It says, he entered the synagogue again. A man was there who had a withered hand. Notice verse 5. When he looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. The man couldn't do it. The man was crippled. His hand was paralyzed. That was an impossible command. And yet he responded. In, in Matthew 14, Jesus says to the apostle Peter, walk on water. Impossible, but he does it. John 5, verse 8, he told the man at, at the pool of Bethesda, rise, take up your bed and walk. There are times that the Lord will give an impossible command, but he also supplies the power to keep it. And this man responded because Jesus spoke to him. The man responded in faith. And I believe that the Lord still tells people to pick up their mats and to walk because he still forgives. And there may be people in this room right now that are crippled, that have had a background of nothing but pain and hurt 
and rejection, a sense of, of not having any value, a sense of being just so lost, someone who's like I was, so tired of, of, of living a life that is really, really a lie, a, a, a life of greatly desiring attention and never getting enough. I was the guy who went to the parties. I used to party a lot. I was the guy who went to the parties who, when everybody was just listening to music, I would get up and I would, uh, by myself in the center of a room, and I would dance around like a fool so people would laugh and think I was funny. I was the guy who did the weird things to make people think that I was cool when, in fact, I was lost. I was the guy who's, who stood on the, the hood of a car while I was driving down the street, and I stood like a living hood ornament and drove by my parents' house, and my mom saw me on this car driving by, standing on the hood, and she hit the window so hard she almost broke it. And when I came in, she said, you're crazy, son, you're nuts, you're crazy. And I remember looking at her going, so what? So what? Because that moment of attention was what I really wanted. I was the kid who during lunchtime, when, you, when I was six years old, I was the kid who ate my lunch by myself because nobody would have lunch with me. And I would sit there thinking of a sick mother who I thought was dying, and I was alone for so long that I needed somebody's attention. And I did anything for it. That was me. That was me. I was the cripple. I was the one who couldn't walk. And I needed more than walking. I needed forgiveness. And that's what Jesus gives you. Son, take up that mat that has been carrying you, and you carry it, because I'm forgiving you of your sins. And when that happened, I want you to see this. He arose, took up the bed, went out, in the presence of them all, and they were all amazed and glorified God. We've never seen anything like this. Can you imagine the joy in this man's soul? His sins were forgiven. It's all done. Micah 7, 18, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever. He delights in mercy. That's our God who forgives us of our sins. And they were amazed. Luke 5, 25 and 26 says, he arose, he rose before them, took up what he had been lying on, departed to his own house, glorifying God. They were all amazed. They glorified God, were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. So the miracle brought glory to God. It drew people to him, and it silenced the Pharisees. You see, when you are made to walk, people also will be drawn to Christ. This was made possible when four friends loved him enough to bring him to Jesus. And when I got saved, that one who was crippled on that mat, I brought my family and I brought my, I brought my friends to Jesus. Sometimes we think it's through certain preachers or evangelists or meetings. Those are all parts of how the Lord works. But most are saved to friends who bring them to Jesus. So let's close by me saying, bring your friends to Jesus because he forgives sins and he makes us able to walk. That's the Savior that we worship.